Today we want to discover what it was like to be on a Zeppelin mission in the First World War. The Zeppelin for this mission is LZ-26, or Z-12, the military name. It's one of the first generation of military Zeppelins with significant improvements over the pre-war civil airships. But with 25,000 cubic meters of hydrogen, 12 tons loading capacity, and close to 100 km per hour speed, it was still not perfectly equipped for the upcoming bomb raids over Britain, but much better than other generations before. It had three Maybach engines with 210 horsepower each. The compartments were now closed for better weather protection. The catwalk was inside the ship's hull for the first time, and the overall shape was a bit more aerodynamic. The full teardrop shape wasn't possible at the time because it was all about increasing production numbers of Zeppelins, and so they kept the diameter of the center rings the same for easier and faster production, instead of having individual ones across the length. Captain of this new Zeppelin was Ernst Lehmann, and together with Max von Gemmingen, nephew of Ferdinand von Zeppelin, he developed this Zeppelin spy basket in this very Zeppelin. If you want to know more about this story and its background, you can check out part 3 of this video series. So after they successfully designed and tested the spy basket, they were waiting for their first mission to finally test it in action. But they ran into problems in the cold winter of 1914-15. The problem was that their Z-12 was not prepared enough for cold weather. During an attack in France in this winter, oil and tanks and pipes became solid, and two of the three engines shut down. It was so cold that the Zeppelin could reach 3,300 meters of altitude, which at the time was a new record. More on the physics behind the Zeppelin and how to manage lift in part 4 of this series. But because of the higher altitude, it was getting even colder. Temperature gauges showed minus 10 degrees Celsius, but only because it was the end of the scale. In reality, it was colder. To be able to come home, the crew ripped the oil tanks open cut pieces out of the solid oil and fed it into the engine, where the oil cubes melted. That way, they could restart the engines and reach their home base. But it was clear that things like this shouldn't happen over England. So now we have March 1915. The Germans just started operating from their new Zeppelin base, Maubeuge, in occupied France, and their instructions were, until further notice, bomb attacks preferably on military targets in England especially London. This order was intentionally not very specific, so the Zeppelin captains could decide when and where they fly. A huge problem at the time was the weather forecast. The main German weather station for attacks on England was in Belgium, close to the front line, and if they reported bad weather, it was already too late for the Zeppelins. So the forecast was basically useless for Zeppelins. So their missions, which could easily last for 20 hours, were always blind in terms of weather, and they had to make decisions during the flight. Because of that, around 30% of the attacks on France and England had to be aborted, and that's even more severe if you remember that Zeppelin missions were only started at good weather. Another problem was orientation. Zeppelin missions were only done in the night, and in wartime cities, at least in England, were pitch black. So they couldn't orientate with city lights, like in peaceful times. And pretty often they couldn't see the stars to navigate. They didn't use radio during the whole operation to not give the enemy any hint, and only used it in case of an emergency on the way back. The front line also required them to fly north first from their new base in France, and they couldn't take the direct way to London. The only orientation they had were the light towers of Steenbrugge and Ostende. If they drew a line between these two lights, it pointed directly at the mouth of the River Thames. We have the 17th of March 1915 now. The weather was getting better and Captain Lehmann arrives at his Zeppelin Z-12 to instruct the crew to get the airship ready. The crew is already very busy. They start test running the engines, the helmsman is checking all rudders, the valves to release hydrogen and water ballast, and the steel cables to control the rudders. The sailmaker is repainting the grey military camouflage color scheme. The zeppelin is being refueled with hydrogen and petrol, and bombs without detonator are being hanged in the bomb chamber. As soon as the ship is ready, Captain Lehmann takes his place in the cockpit. The ground crew removes the sandbags and the ship starts hovering in the hull. 
the ground crew holds the handles to keep it on the ground and pulls the zeppelin out of the hangar. The watch officer, who led the ground crew, jumps on board and another person, who was only on board to replace his weight, jumps off. The ship points against the wind and is releasing water ballast now to balance its lift. Now the engines go on full throttle and the ship heads towards Ostende. They cannot find a single cloud to hide from the English sea blockade. They can see English patrol boats on the water and, as a precaution, put out all lights on board. The only light they still have is now the engine control board, with which Lehmann slows down the engines now to create less noise. The helmsman is now only a dark shape at the wheel, the radio officer sits in a small room listening with headphones to all the chaotic noises they can receive, the huge ship's antenna hangs below the ship with a zeppelin shaped weight at the end and looks like a baby zeppelin following the mother. The cold air creeps into windows and floor. Although they wear double underwear and thick fur outfits, everyone is freezing. The crew drinks hot coffee to stay warm. To use the waiting time until they get to the English coast, Captain Lehmann and Lieutenant von Gemming take a control walk through the ship. First they climb the slippery cold aluminium ladder into the hull. The cars were housing the engines at the time and since they wanted to keep the ignition system away from the hydrogen in the hull, they kept a certain gap between them. Only the American airships, which were filled with helium, placed their Maybach engines in the hull 20 years later. And this climb up wasn't easy. You had the cold wind blowing with around 100 km per hour and pressing you on the ladder. And with their thick leather clothes it was easy to slip off that ladder. It happened that crew members fell 2500 meters down into the dark North Sea and were never seen again. The catwalk went through the whole ship from front to rear and above and at the sides were the hydrogen gas cells, oil and fuel tanks. Also here Everything was dark and small, self-luminous pieces guided the way. All crew members were wearing thick fur boots with rubber or straw sole to not damage the ship and to avoid sparks. When Lehmann walked underneath the gas cells, he heard a noise and used his torch. He found the sailmaker who was climbing like a monkey in the dark between the gas cells to check them for leaks. He wears a special overall without buttons to not damage any cells. He always has a small pot with glue and a brush close to him to be able to close a bullet hole as quickly as possible. His job is very important on a military airship, but also very dangerous because he could easily pass out if he breathes too much gas. That's why he's always accompanied by a second person watching him climb. In contrast to peace times, there is no additional crew on board to work in shifts. Every position has just one person and the shift is as long as the mission goes. If you can save 300 kilograms and crew members, you can take 300 kilograms more bombs. So the crew beds close to the catwalk are empty now. Just behind them in the dark is a noise. One crew member sitting on the Zeppelin's pit toilet and quickly jumping up when he saw the captain with his torch. The captain instructs the cook to prepare a hot soup for the crew before they reach England. There is not much food on board, because either they are back after 20 hours or never. The things they have on board are bread, butter, ham, a few eggs, a bit of chocolate, tea, coffee and some cognac against the cold. In the middle of the ship the catwalk becomes wider with a large hole in the middle. This is the bomb chamber and you can see the shiny water underneath the ship. One wrong step in the dark hull and you're falling into the North Sea. In the weak light you can see the bombs hanging like pears at the sides. They have high explosive bombs from 58 to 300 kg and also phosphor bombs in the chamber. The bombs are still secured, but the bomb officer is already lying on his belly on the floor and looking through the window to the ground to prepare. Lehmann continues to the back of the ship and climbs the ladder down into the rear car with its two Maybach engines. There is so little space that the two mechanics can barely move. They sit next to the screaming engines the air is full of oil and exhaust gas. The captain cannot breathe here and asks them to open the cooling inlets. Now ice cold air flows into the car, which is not much better. The mechanics have to sit in this tiny noisy space for the whole duration of the mission. And often the destiny of the ship is up to them, 
when we have to fix an engine or a propeller in the air to fly back home. Such a Zeppelin crew is a very close group. Also, the captain knows each one of his crew members personally, knows their families and backgrounds. On the way back, Lehmann climbs up the 15 meter high ladder to the top of the ship. Here is one person with a machine gun waiting for enemy planes. He has a speaking tube down to the cockpit to tell them about anything he observed. Important here is that the gunner on top is only allowed to fire if he has the OK from the cockpit. Because the gas release chimneys of the Zeppelin are at the top as well. So if the people in the cockpit release gas and the gunner on top fires, the gas could be ignited by the machine gun. It's now 11 p.m. when Lehmann comes back to the cockpit. They reach the English coast with its white cliffs and they are wondering if they could cross the coastline this time without being noticed or at least undamaged. A bit strange is that they cannot see anything in the background. A little later they see why. They are in the thickest fog. Lehmann brings the ship up to 3000 meters, but the fog is still the same. They fly in every direction in the hope to find the river Thames, because usually clouds are weaker above rivers. Now they fly as low as possible, but it's still the same. They cannot find the largest city in the world. The only thing they did find is a wild anti-aircraft gun on the ground shooting in the sky, but soon they also cannot see this one anymore. So they turn around and head for Calais. Calais is not darkened and they can see the lights of the city from far away. To their surprise, the weather conditions here are perfect to test their new spy basket system. The clouds are at 1200 meters altitude and the air below is crystal clear. Before they reach Calais, von Gemming and Lehmann are getting into an argument about who will sit in the spy basket. Both men develop the system together and in the end they conclude that Lehmann, as the captain, should stay in the cockpit. They turn the engines down as much as possible to create as little noise as possible, but still enough to be able to control the ship. They lower the spy basket with von Gemming inside by 800 meters and the Zeppelin dives into the clouds. And by the way, the spy basket was the only place on a Zeppelin where you were allowed to smoke, until the Hindenburg, 20 years later, had a smoker launch. The small spy basket is invisible from the ground and von Gemming has a perfect view on the city. The air defense of Calais fortress can hear the Zeppelin's engine sound and they fire in the direction of the noise but they cannot hit the airship. The crew and the cockpit couldn't see anything but darkness and fog. But von Gemming in the spy basket directs them through the telephone and compass. They fly 45 minutes above Calais and attack five times. Von Gemming instructs them when and which bombs to use. And by the way, a Zeppelin had a pretty good accuracy in bombing because it was relatively low and slow. They destroyed this train station parts of the port, which was the main port of the British army in France, ammunition storages and other buildings. Sometimes the cockpit crew noticed some oval shapes in the clouds. These were the searchlights on the ground which couldn't see through the clouds. Meanwhile, on the ground, people were panicking, because they couldn't see the Zeppelin, but it was bombing them for 45 minutes. The officials were guessing how it was possible to make a Zeppelin invisible. They suspected an optical system with mirrors and colors, although scientists already proved before that this would be impossible. The French police, however, arrested a number of bicycle riders because they were suspected to give signals to the Zeppelin with lamps. After this successful mission, Z-12 returned home. When they reached their base, the captain stopped the engines to stop the Zeppelin in the air and to try the lift of the ship without the dynamic lift of the aerodynamics. The helmsman confirmed that they are descending slowly. Lehmann just wanted to restart the engine when he noticed black smoke from chimneys around the ship. In the 12 hours since the beginning of the mission, air pressure changed so much that their altitude indicator showed them 100 meters too much. Before they could drop some ballast, the Zeppelin crashed on the railway next to the airfield. The front car dropped on a bridge, the hull of the ship on the tracks and the tail hit a telephone post which ripped some of the rudders off. The crew quickly jumped off to stop any trains and they fixed the Zeppelin in this position overnight. The next day they brought Z-12 back to his hangar and fixed it within the next two weeks. 
Z12 became the most successful Zeppelin in terms of drop bomb load in the First World War and was retired and dismantled in 1917. So the Zeppelin bomb missions in the First World War required highest level of resilience, professionalism and discipline from its crew. Rever, strong defense and their complex machine made it hard to master a mission. And so success and failure were very close friends. I hope you liked this historical insight and if you did, please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for more videos like this. See you at the next one.